ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another webinar from Philips Lighting University. Today's webinar is titled Lighting University Office Lighting Technical Opportunities for a Healthier Working Environment and it will be presented by Professor Michael Rohde. Professor Michael Rohde is an independent lighting designer and professor of architectural lighting design and architecture at the University of Technology business and design in Wismar, Germany. So without any further delay, I now hand over to Professor Michael Rode. Welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here at the Philips Lighting University. And I would like to start my presentation about office lighting, technical opportunities for a healthier working environment with a quote from a famous Italian architect Dove non va il sole, va il medico, or in English, where the sun does not go, the doctor does. So this is actually from Vidovius in his famous 10 books on architecture. The reason for the quote from Vitruvius at the very beginning indicates the concern that daylight is the most important factor if quality is an issue of relevance. In today's architecture, Vitruvius is well known for his definition of the classic principles of harmony, proportion and symmetry. But in the famous 10 books on architecture, he wrote that the true architect should be able to cope with mathematics, geometry, optics, acoustics, astronomy, philosophy, history, law and significantly medicine. Knowledge of medicine was important if an architect wanted to choose healthy sites for the city as well as for buildings. In his books, he already described the solar architecture of dwellings as being adapted to suit the different climates inherent to the Roman Empire. When I found this quote and the thoughts, I was really impressed and I actually think that we can learn from it. Let's have a quick look on the content, I would like to start with the inspiration on daylight actually, then I will have a close look at the spectrum of light, artificial and daylight. I would like to go with you quickly through the history of workplaces, just a, a quick look, then follow some own projects and also an outlook at the end. I would like to finish my presentation with a conclusion. Let's be inspired by daylight. I think daylight is the most important if it comes to lighting and if we as lighting designers are able to get the qualities that daylight incorporates, I think we're doing a good job. So the relationship of daylight and the human beings, I would say light has determined the path of our evolution, the rhythm of our daily lives, vision and perception, our emotions and light, daylight, gives direction and orientation. This could be somewhere in Germany. This could be also somewhere in Germany or Middle Europe. It's a mix in the daylight composition of direct and diffuse components. And probably this can be taken as the ideal way of getting light also into an interior. So this mix of diffuse components caused by the clouds and the direct component of the sun is from my point of view really not only fascinating but it also gives a nice impact on the feeling of our well-being. Now let's have a look at the quality of daylight. It has truly a full color spectrum and what you see here on the left hand side is just showing that almost all colors are there in almost the same intensity. If daylight is put through a prism, then we can see the colors and a natural um, fantastic scenery is if there is a rainbow and if we see in the rainbow the colors that are in the daylight spectrum. 
Now here we just have a look at the comparison. So in the front there is the compact fluorescent, uh, very similar or almost the same as for fluorescence in general. We see the incandescent uh, in the second line, the LED, and again in the back, the quality of daylight or that what we should achieve if it comes to artificial lighting. Now, I think we are in the happy situation that the time of the fluorescent light sources have come and is almost over or is beginning to be at an end. The incandescent still, I think, is a very good light source. Uh, the problem is the energy consumption because it's producing more heat than light. The LED is quite good, or let's say it could be as good as daylight if we find a manufacturer that is doing an LED light source with the same spectral composition um, as sunlight or daylight. Now this is just an image which reminds us that daylight is full of colors. So we have a constant change from warm and cool color temperatures, typically in the morning more um, red, same in the evening and in the path of the day we have more um, blue components. Now here we see just what happens uh, if we look at it close. This is typically uh, the summertime. Uh, the smallest curve is the winter time and the middle curve is for springtime and autumn. Now we are at about moving into the uh, springtime. Uh, at the very top we see the maximum lux level according to, to time of year. And also we see that we are going through all the colors. In the morning we are starting with red, then we go through blue, green, yellow, orange, and at the end of day we are getting back to the very warm color, to the red color. The timeline you see on the, um, uh, on the, on the bottom, uh, so it starts at 4 o'clock in the uh, summertime and it ends at uh, 8 o'clock in the evening and this is related to a place in the south of uh, Germany. And these are the measured colors, it's not just an image to explain, it is the measured color components uh, done by the Institut für Farbendynamik. And on the left hand side you just see a typical lighting situation in blue which stands for pass of day and uh, at the bottom more the orange and red component for the evening and the morning situation. Now daylight, I would say daylight, the mother of nature, that is to say for man and all life on earth, because we should not forget that uh, it is not only us living here and the animals, it also concerns every living thing, including plants and whatsoever. Let's have a quick look at the office lighting in the history. Uh, I was quite amazed to see this office situation from an Egyptian funerary model uh, of a granary from the tomb of Meket Re in Theban in uh, the 11th dynasty in Egypt. So they already had this uh, experience. Now that is just a typical situation uh, at the end uh, of the 19th century. A luxury situation from 1920, that's New Jersey headquarters for Prudential, an insurance company. Of course, a fantastic situation uh, to be seated in, in such an environment, high room height. And uh, yeah, of course, that is also to impress the clients. I found this image from 1959, the Union Carbide headquarters in New York City, designed by Skidmore. Owings and Merrill, a famous architectural firm from the United States. I think uh, the aim was to have perfect office lighting. The total diffusion through the glass panels uh, reminds us to a daylight situation where we have an overcast sky. I think the strategy and the design looks absolutely fantastic, but I would not know if I would like to work there because I think after a certain time this total diffused light would 
uh, yeah, give me a lack of a direct component and I think it would make me feel dizzy. So, um, but I'm sure that the client paid a lot of money for this installation and I think it's quite interesting uh, to see what strategies were followed to get good office lighting quality. Um, yeah, this is a, a funny image I found. It's from the 80s in Germany somewhere, Fördergemeinschaft Gutes Licht, where they were just trying to figure out what is good office lighting. Now, uh, a typical situation, only women are typewriting. And uh, uh, if you look, the lighting is actually uh, hidden uh, behind this red um, funny bowls or whatever. And uh, the, the lighting is pretty boring and typical for that time period. Now, that is already the time when computing was important. I would also think that I don't like to sit under these enormous uh, mega down lights. Also, the light distribution, I think, is not so super nice. But however, it is interesting uh, to see how office lighting was developed. And uh, here, I guess it was a quite expensive um, uh, installation, but uh, obviously uh, it doesn't uh, exist anymore. That is from the same time and uh, I like to show this because I think this has a very nice lighting ambience. It has a mix of diffuse and direct component and this was not uh, done with an LED installation because that didn't, uh, did not exist at that time. Uh, but uh, however, uh, similar luminaires based on LED technology I could be used here and I think one would get the same quality in LED if the same or similar components would be developed. Let's have a quick look at the types of lighting that we knowing or which we can say are typical for office lighting. I'm starting with the first one top uh, left that is uh, the direct component. It's either in a suspended ceiling or surface mounted. Uh, only direct component has just one component. The second image just shows floor luminaires with only indirect lighting. Um, probably quite good for exclusive um, only use of, uh, of uh, computers. But uh, if you have uh, a task um, in writing or reading, uh, it might be um, a bit difficult. Now, the third uh, thing is uh, a kind of mellow light, something that was developed by one luminaire manufacturer some, some years ago. That is actually uh, a mix of diffused light and a bit of direct component. The fourth, uh, what we see here is suspended luminaires, direct, indirect, quite often used and could be a quite good result for uh, the office environment. And last but not least, the fifth installation is suspended luminaires, just with an indirect component and an additional uh, task light that is uh, lighting uh, the table. Now, um, what uh, of these concept is the best? Um, I would say the first one, the direct, uh, is not so good because uh, uh, it might make the look, the look of the room too low. Uh, there is no light on the ceiling, only if there is a, a white floor or a white table that bounces back the light. Uh, the second one is probably um, good if one would add a task light uh, as table luminaires or integrated in the floor luminaires. Uh, the middle is yeah, in between uh, could be also improved by a task light. And I think actually the second last and especially the last one with the indirect light plus the task light is the best lighting that we can get. I would like to show you a few projects that uh, we did in my office. The first one is uh, the Deutsche Post, a project that we did in 2003. And uh, it was a project where we had a client that really was doing everything that the architect and also the lighting designer wanted to do. Typical good lighting of the entrance, 
uh, it's a carpet of light that is giving the signal well this is the entrance so it's the architectural um, gesture with a with a roof with a canopy that shows uh, you go in here please but also the lighting is important especially if it's get if it's getting darker now the lighting component is not just uh, a downlight it is a special downlight which increases the vertical component which is important to see the face of the people the visitors of the office building actually we were able to do almost everything that we wanted to do the client was really open for new ideas so um, we were also able to backlight the floor which of course is not needed but uh, it gave a certain quality to the lobby of this tower and they were happy to share this and of course also have to pay for it um, this is for me an um, interesting example uh, how you can really bring daylight components into an artificial lighting uh, situation so here this is actually the lift lobby and the speciality of the lift lobby is that uh, it has um, translucent glass you cannot look through but you have the possibility to get the light from above and here actually when we suggest to the client we would like to use uh, quite narrow beam spotlights that you see here on the left and right hand side the next one this one is actually uh, the mirror effect in the glass wall and they were a bit suspicious because normally one would not do such a type of uh, lighting in uh, in the lift lobby. Uh, we were lucky to do uh, a mock-up and uh, with that mock-up we proved that exactly we were getting what we wanted. So we had the direct component from the from the from the floor where we were standing and the diffuse component was coming from underneath and from above. So this mix uh, is pretty much as what you get if you are in a nice um, forest uh, situation and the client saw that and we were able to do it. Apart from that the architect was very keen that the lighting uh, was integrated uh, in the architectural environment so this is actually a painted concrete uh, ceiling and we had to make sure that the lighting was going to be yeah it looked like it was poured out uh, together with the concrete already. Uh, if you see on the right hand side the average typical office, there is uh, one thing missing. Uh, that photo was taken when the task lights were not uh, there. So if you go to this uh, office today, you have additionally two uh, task lights on the table for the typical workforce. Well, uh, there was um, Jan Kesseli, the famous, um, the famous um, artist from Paris. He was responsible for the um, facade lighting, and we actually uh, had to put this into the um, specification, and we had to include it in the general lighting. So um, these colors were used in a very, very slow motion for uh, evenings and the nighttime. Um, and um, I think in 2003, one was happy that colors could be used. Maybe today one would be a bit more conscious about uh, using so much colored light, at least talking about Germany. Um, there is a high consciousness of light pollution and uh, also discover that the night is an important element in our daily life. I'm coming to the next project, which is much smaller, but which had a huge impact on uh, my further development of being a lighting designer. And also uh, I put quite a high emphasis uh, on light and hills since I had this project. Now, what you see here is daytime and nighttime photo. And the colors that you're seeing on the right hand side uh, were just not an artistic concept, but it shows that the workforce was able um, to decide for the colors of the indirect component. Now, the story to it was that the boss of the institution asked me when I had the contract that he said, well, please do a lighting that 
you ever wanted to do first and secondly make sure that nobody else has it and when he said that um, I, I knew already what what I was going to do so uh, I wanted to check if people would use different color temperatures uh, in order to improve their uh, well-being and uh, eventually also the health issue being in the uh, in their office. So uh, I suggested to use an RGB luminaire that was developed especially for this project. And here you see the installation. It is a combi office type. So the luminaire has two direct components uh, giving the task light and only the indirect component would be um, with RGB and each person could choose the color. When I said color, for me it was color temperature, but at the end I realized that the people were using color heavily. So when I came into that office two weeks after uh, they moved in, I saw this and I actually was quite shocked because I thought, oh my god, there is something wrong with the technology because I was not expecting people to use that color. So I went to the people and asked them, hello, how are you? I hope you're good. Um, how do you feel? And then they said after two weeks, oh, well, you know, today I'm more in the red. Yesterday I was more in the blue and I was quite surprised. You might know that in the German language, if you say ich bin blau, that means the person is drunk. Well, that was for me very interesting and uh, that was when I started to look into that subject of light and color and I was quite surprised to find out that there is a lot of knowledge about light, color and health aspects. And when I heard that uh, a woman from that office found out that with the special green she could actually get rid of her migraine, uh, I finally was convinced that there is something else going on with the right amount of color or the right choice of colors uh, in a workplace. So that brought me to the question, um, how can we use colors in a sensible way? And actually, when I started my research, I was quite surprised that in 1903 there was the Nobel Prize in Medicine for Niels Rieberg Finsen uh, who discovered that uh, uh, tuber uh, skin tuberculosis could be healed with uh, the so-called Finsen lamp or luminaire. Uh, here you see on the right hand side how people are treated. That is actually the disease that... Sorry. Um, here you see what uh, they were treating and at that time um, people or um, physicians were cutting off pieces of the skin and uh, after um, um, this discovery it was uh, able to heal. So on the left hand side you see the disease, on the right hand side you see the woman when things uh, are going well. Well, since that project I was really interested in uh, light and health issues and it brought me to many many interesting things. Uh, I would like to quote Alexander Wunsch. He is a, in the meantime dear friend. He is a physician in Heidelberg and I would like to mention that from my point of view he is probably the best lighting therapist that you can get uh, in this country. Uh, he is also teaching here at the University in Wismar and <clears throat> he said any deviation from the spectrum of natural light has pathogenic potential. So I think good lighting in offices starts with the selection of the right spectral distribution. Now on the right hand side, I think we don't have the time to look at that in detail, but uh, you see actually how the sun is going through the visible spectrum through the eye and has a big impact uh, into our pineal gland. And meanwhile, it has an influence on melatonin, the pineal hormone, sleep hormone and the winter hormone. And uh, on the other side, uh, the infrared, the visible light and the UV is going through the skin and has an influence on the sun hormone 
and many other uh, hormones, uh, one of the most important ones and that we know is the vitamin D um, and a big influence on many things in our body. So if you would like to follow up this, I would recommend to go on Alexander's website, which is photonblog.de. And uh, I would like to point out that if you would like to hear Alexander or many other interesting people who were guests at the Light Symposium 2016 in Wismar last year, uh, please go on the website www.lightsymposium.de and then you can still click the right button on the right hand side, Light Symposium 2016, and you can listen to all the presentations uh, that we had uh, in October last year. Here actually you see uh, Mark Major uh, talking about the qualities of architectural lighting design. Uh, not really linked uh, from that aspect to light and health issues, but uh, you find actually um, Alexander as a keynote speaker on photo and chronology and uh, how it influences how it is influenced by natural and artificial light. Then Alexander Wunsch was in a second speech talking about skin and beauty. Uh, Professor Dr. Richard Funk, effects of blue light on retina, retinal photoreceptors. Charlotte Remy, how our retina works, the bright and dark side of light. And also, I think very important, Magda Havas talking about electrosmog, electrosensitivity and the LED light bulbs. Much further information, please uh, take the time and visit uh, the lightsymposium.de website. You will find a lot of uh, interesting further information. Well, let's have a look into the future. Uh, here is just one luminaire uh, that looks very technical. I think it is very technical. What makes it, from my point of view, interesting, you could use it uh, and you can uh, switch each component individually. So you could have more light from the left or right hand side, which would enable us to yeah, just see if somebody is using the right or left hand uh, for writing. Uh, of course, one has to check how uh, it's working from the glare control and how um, veiling glare or things like that might act on the table, but I think it is interesting, an interesting use of uh, LED technology. Uh, another issue, uh, another luminaire that I think is quite nice, it is uh, if it the light is switched off, you can just look through and uh, it doesn't look like a luminaire. And in the moment you switch it on, you see that uh, the acrylic panel has a lighting technology function and uh, also the distribution is quite nice. It has 70% direct component and 30% indirect component. I have this Lumina actually in my meeting room in my office in Berlin. Uh, it's very nice, but to be honest, the uh, manufacturer I think has to work on the uh, flicker because it has a terrible uh, flicker if you dim it down. And I think that is also an important issue uh, in the quality of office lighting. Now, that is uh, an interesting luminaire that we found for another project. It doesn't look like an office luminaire and um, it, that I think makes it interesting. So uh, if these opal or diffuse elements are turned down, of course, it is not useful for uh, an office environment where glare problems might occur. But you can just turn it around and it gives you a lot of flexible and interesting um, aspects and components in using in an office. So this is uh, something of interest. Activity-based lighting. A sensor is sensing persons and automatically increasing or decreasing the lux levels.
So if the person is away, it goes down to 100. If the person comes back, 500. Gives the chance to change the color temperature within the pass of day. This could be any other product, of course. Now, for me, the question is, would we or would you like to be under a system that is just working automatically? I have worked under such conditions, I remember. Now she is increasing the lux level through the telephone, through the smartphone. 800 lux and then she's leaving. Well, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. However, what I think is a problem here is that I would not like to sit under a system that is working automatically I would love to have my own influence obviously it is possible but of course if such an installation is made you have to buy a lot of equipment you have to buy a lot of luminaires otherwise the concept is not working so that is technology quite interesting to use this light sensor that is doing that kind of job but I personally would have some question marks if I would like to work that way Well, let's have an outlook what happens in the future of lighting, what happens um, in the meantime, <coughs> being a freelance lighting designer, we have not so many office projects anymore, because very often, at least in Germany, this is done by the electrical engineers. I don't know if that is good for uh, the uh, entire business, but that's a matter of fact. We have actually at for the time being an interesting uh, project. Uh, it is uh, the Google Expansion Berlin. It's partly a new building, part, partly what you see here is from the old Charité clinic in Berlin, the operation theater that was used by Professor Sauerbruch, a, a famous German physician. And um, this is going to be a kind of an office. Um, and we have not finished our design, but uh, I just wanted to share what we can do right now. I think the time of the LED gives us a lot of chances, interesting solutions. Uh, we can consider things that were absolutely impossible to do, especially if you look uh, to these luminaires on the left hand side. That I think is uh, a, a good possibility to make this room look more interesting. But this is not just a fuzzy luminaire, it can be really used for lighting the space and it could have an indirect component as well if it, this would be desired or it could be more in a rectangular shape. Uh, then other areas where we could go for um, type of luminaire that we couldn't use five or ten years ago. I think the age of uh, LED lighting is now really interesting and we could use extremely interesting um, solutions together with develop with the architects and the interior designers. Uh, this is just preliminary concept design and we are still in discussion but I think uh, this is also a kind of workplace or office. Office places are also part of this um, um, building, but not in a very traditional kind of way. Um, here you see just a, a staircase and uh, we actually have to take these uh, screens uh, as part of the installation also into consideration for the artificial lighting concept. Uh, just another area, here you, here you see that the um, 
lighting is adapted to different uh, times of day. Uh, the color temperature is easily to be changed, which of course adds also um, to the quality of um, the office or work environment. Another area that looks more like, um, yeah, having a break, but still that can be the place to create creative ideas for new projects. And Google is actually, for us, a very interesting client because they are really interested and very keen on having a healthy environment that is not only provided by offering good free food for uh, the workforce, but also creating a um, healthy environment from all other aspects, and that includes lighting, and uh, we are very happy uh, for this uh, project. Unfortunately, I can show you for the time being only preliminary um, images. And that brings me to the office lighting checklist. So this is something that you can take uh, as a manual uh, and how can we, that hopefully answers the question, how can we create the modern work, <coughs> work environment or workplace? Uh, of course, glare-free installations and lux levels and uniformity uh, in some areas are important, uh, but I think there are other things more important. So glare-free is extremely important from any point of view, according to daylight or also to uh, artificial light. Uh, minimum lux levels at least are also important if you have a reading task or any other uh, important task where lux levels play a role. Uniformity, I think, is not so important in the entire space. Uh, these terms come from actually from the norms, the European norms or the German norms. Uh, what I think is even more important um, is a full color spectrum. It should be as close as possible to daylight. And I think here we have to challenge the manufacturer to produce better LED components, which is possible, but we have to require it. Then, uh, apart from the full color spectrum, that is also, of course also linked, uh, we need an excellent uh, color rendering. And, <coughs> sorry, uh, I think uh, also the new technology brings uh, an easy dim down situation. So each person should be able to dim to the individual lux server that is desired. And uh, I think one should um, try to respect the individuality of each person. Uh, for me, that has the top pr priority, and I would prefer that rather than having an automated system that uh, has other aspects um, in the mind. So, uh, the question is, is an automated approach with cool and warm color temperature likewise in the human-centric lighting, is that really wanted? Uh, I think it should be put to the individual to decide what ti what uh, kind of color temperature or even color is desired. Uh, very important, I think, is that office lighting or any artificial lighting in the future will be free of flicker and electrosmog. Uh, very many of the luminaires that we check uh, have a huge problem by that. Last but not least, a good mix of direct and indirect lighting creates, I think, very good lighting. I'm coming to the end. I'm coming to the conclusion. And I would like to show you a last project that we did some time ago in Chicago for the university. Um, in Chicago, it's the Mansueto Library uh, that we did with uh, Helmut Jahn, the architect. Uh, and um, the main thing, the main building is underneath Earth, uh, storing uh, the books. So that's what you don't see here. Uh, what I would like to share with you is the inside of the reading room, uh, which is fully covered with glass, but it includes a daylighting control. So the upper part has a 57% frit print on the glass. So that takes off um, the infrared and also 75% off glass. Uh, of, uh, of light. It's a good glare control, but you still can look nicely 
outside and here you see the work environment. This student is actually working uh, on his laptop and in every direction you just see the university campus and uh, it gives you the feeling you are sitting likewise under a tree and you do your reading or you do your work. So you have no glare, you have just um, the situation that you look into the light and you see what happens and you are behind the glass which means that you have uh, a good working <coughs> condition. The artificial lighting that we developed with the architects is actually a mix uh, out of um, indirect light that is put on the air kiosk. So here is the indirect component which uh, makes the glass and steel structure not look too dark because that has something scary. And then for the direct component we have actually these type of spotlights that give enough light, good lighting for the floor. Then the reading tables have integrated light. In this case, uh, it was still fluorescent. I'm going one back. This is actually already an LED light source integrated in this uh, quite nicely designed tish, including the luminaire. And um, yeah, and actually the quality in daytime and in the evening is quite nice. What I'm saying, my message is use daylight as much as you can. Of course, you have to make sure that it is working well with the ge geographic uh, situation. In Middle Europe, of course, we have other situations uh, going to, let's say, India or Southern Asia, where you have um, daylight, uh, you have not a very positive view on daylight because you have to make sure that you're not getting too much of it. Uh, but first of all, I think the use of daylight uh, is very important and should be considered first for uh, any kind of uh, office uh, type. That brings me almost to the end. And I hope this was an interesting talk for you and I would like to thank you for your participation and uh, interest.